Our guiding principle is prudence, not austerity. We'll continue to invest decisively in our national priorities with a deep commitment to leave behind a better future for our children. In Parliament today, DPM Heng Sui Kiet speaks on Singapore's progress in combating COVID-19. Other big issues raised in Parliament today, the Manpower Ministry will review its penalties for employers who illegally deploy their mates. COVID positive but surprising supporters on the road wants the latest with Donald Trump. Good evening, 5.30pm here in Singapore. You're watching The Big Story. Coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom, I'm Dylan Ng. And I'm Harianto Diman. Now you can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Issues related to the high-profile case of former maid Party Liani was hotly debated in Parliament today, with MPs filing 14 parliamentary questions. The Manpower Ministry will review its framework of penalties for employers who illegally deploy their foreign domestic workers. In light of the particular vulnerability of foreign domestic workers, we will review our punishment framework and uh, action will be taken against employers in similar illegal deployment cases, regardless of whether they are aware of the illegal deployment. This is to remind the employers that they are ultimately accountable for their foreign domestic workers and should take steps to ensure that their household's deployment of the foreign domestic workers do not contravene the law. Ms Gan was responding to Yo Wan Ling on the considerations behind the MOM's action against the employer of Ms Party, former Changi Airport Group Chairman Liu Man Leong, for her illegal de deployment and whether they are consistent with similar cases in the past. Other questions requested for more information regarding the scope of the Independent Review Committee. In response to these, uh, to these Home Affairs and Law Minister K. Shamugam didn't comment. He's expected to make a ministerial statement about the case in next month's parliament sitting. Now, Singapore editor at The Straits Times, Zakir Hussein, joins us now to share more on today's parliament proceedings. Hi, Zakir. Hi. Zakir, with 14 parliamentary questions filed on issues related to the Party Liani case, it was expected to be discussed at length during this parliament sitting, but uh, this wasn't the case. Were you surprised uh, that debate on these issues were wrapped up fairly quickly? I guess in a way, um, I wasn't entirely surprised. I think uh, Minister Shanmugam did signal uh, late last week uh, that the review was still ongoing and um, that his planned ministerial statement uh, could only be made in the November sitting of Parliament. Now, Law and uh, Home Affairs Minister K. Shamungam and Minister of State for Manpower Gan Xiao Huang addressed these 14 questions. Were they adequately answered, you think? Well, um, I think they couldn't answer um, many of the questions that had to do with the police and AGC review, which um, are still ongoing. Um, and I think the minister did indicate that, um, you know, when uh, they are completed, uh, he will give a full accounting to Parliament, and that will include addressing these questions uh, next month. Um, but Minister of State Gunn, um, you know, for the Ministry of Manpower side of the House, did uh, say that they are, com they are going to um, relook the framework um, by which um, employers who flout the law on illegal deployment of maids um, are penalised. And I think it's a fairly common issue. Um, it's, it's, you know, the recent case actually did draw attention to it. Um, quite a number of employers uh, did end up being fined and the fines did range in, you know, to quite substantial amounts. I think in the case of uh, Ms. Party's employers, they only got a warning, um, but they said this was consistent with um, other similar instances. Mm. Well, thank you, Zakir. Now, do stay put as we have more questions for you later on. Now, moving on, a Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, Heng Swicket, said the government will extend the enhanced training support package. It was previous, previously enhanced in the resilience budget, and this time the package will be extended for another six months. I will extend the ETSP for another six months until 30th June 2021 to provide enhanced cost fee subsidies for firms in our hardest hit sectors. I will extend the ETSP to the marine and offshore sector from today. 
on top of the existing sectors such as air transport, retail and tourism. In recognition of the gradually recovering economic situation, we'll also be lowering the absentee payroll rates to 80% from January 2021, capped at $7.50 per hour. Now, further enhancements to support schemes will be made to help firms both in hard-hit sectors. For instance, DPM Heng also announced the extension of the temporary bridging loan program for six months until September 2021 at reduced levels. The program is aimed at helping local companies manage their immediate cash flow needs. Other measures are also being put in place and extended for firms that are growing. The higher tier of wage support at 50% under the Jobs Growth Incentive Scheme will be provided to firms who hire people with disabilities between September 2020 to February 2021. Now, several grants and programs like the Market Readiness Assistance Grant, Productivity Solutions Grant and Enterprise Development Grant will also be enhanced to enable firms to tap new sources of growth. In addition, the Monetary Authority of Singapore will also extend the MAS Support Dollar Facility for Enterprise Singapore Loans until September 2021. Now, DPM Heng also announced more support for newborns. This one-off support measure comes on top of the baby bonus cash gift, which provides eligible parents up to $10,000 in benefits. We have received feedback that COVID-19 has caused some aspiring parents to postpone their parenthood plans. This is fully understandable, especially when they face uncertainty with their income. Hence, to help with expenses during this period, will introduce a one-off additional support for newborns. This will be on top of the baby bonus cash gift, which provides eligible parents up to $10,000 in benefits. Minister Indrani will share more details on the additional support soon. Let's bring in Singapore editor Zakir Hussain again. Zakir, Mr Heng spoke at length in Parliament today, giving an update on Singapore's progress in our fight against COVID-19. Now, what stood out for you? I think a couple of things uh, did stand out. One was the, you know, I think the, the newborn extra cash support came as a bit of a surprise. Uh, we had expected, you know, there'd be no new measures. Um, and in a sense, this was more in a, you know, perhaps an extension of some of the support measures like uh, the bridging loan and all that, that have come about. Um, the other thing was I think the marine and offshore sectors are also feeling the brunt of the pandemic and the crisis. And I think it's good that, um, you know, these, it, it's a key sector for the Singapore economy. And I think it's good that they get the same level of enhanced support that um, those affected workers in aviation and tourism already do. Mm. Uh, Zakir, Mr. Hing also revealed uh, that a uh, hundred dollar billion, uh, the hundred dollar billion uh, figure, and he also mentioned that uh, the latest uh, support measures will not draw uh, from past reserves uh, anymore. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So I think uh, the hundred billion did uh, come about, and and that was the total amount that Singapore's devoted to the pandemic since it's uh, started earlier this year. Um, the estimates that the, the estimate is that it saved about 155,000 jobs through the job support scheme, possibly more. And um, I think a lot more is being done to ensure that some of these um, workers, I think, uh, you know, get the training and support and skills uh, upgrades they need uh, to stay um, competitive. Mm. Um, I think the other point that that really. Um, Minister elaborated on was this sort of brought three broad strategies um, to keep the economy um, vibrant for the next you know five to ten years, and I think it's worth um, underlining. One is the first is to position Singapore as a strong, um, what we call a, what he called the global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. You know where we sort of um, strengthen our regional supply links, um, and at the same time. Uh, also look at you know fostering inclusive growth so in a way making sure that all workers get the skills and support they need but that also um, just like the extension of the jobs growth initiative to include uh, persons with disabilities um, to ensure that you know we take measures and, and steps to ensure that we stay inclusive and I think the last of the three-pronged strategies is really this investment in 
resilience and sustainability. So this include, um, you know, ramping up our plans to uh, produce more food locally and at the same time uh, to look at areas like green growth, renewable energy and sustainability. And Zaki, are these uh, approaches new? Would you consider them new? I think they're not entirely new, um, but I think the way uh, coming at this point in, in you know, uh, six months after the crisis hit us um, and at a time when you know, questions might be asked about what plans we have for the future, I think uh, DPM Hing underlined that, look, we've, we've had these plans in place. Um, they build on what's been suggested and proposed before. But um, this might be a time for us to relook and revisit this and maybe see how um, you know, <clears throat> some of the measures and plans um, we're putting out in the next few months could um, better uh, strengthen some of these arms. So for instance, if you talk about um, ensuring resilient supply chains, right? And then, uh, one way to do that might be to look out, look, relook our say free trade agreements and, and make sure that you know, we've got, um, these include areas like the digital economy. Um, similarly, for inclusive growth, making sure that uh, persons with disabilities and people who might not normally be in the workforce or find it difficult to travel for work, um, you know, we look at finding ways to make sure that they get matched and supported by the job, you know, with jobs and with training as well. Well, thank you, Zakir, for coming on the show. We've been speaking to Singapore editor at the Straits Times, Zakir Hussein. Now, catch up on today's Parliament proceedings at StraitsTimes.com. Now, also raised in Parliament, DPM Heng also said more details on when Singapore will enter the third stage of its phase reopening will be released by the multi-ministry task force in the coming weeks. This roadmap will include the expected timeline for moving to phase three, changes to current regulations on the size of group gatherings and participation at mass events. Meanwhile, Health Minister Gan Kim Yong said there can be more easing of our pandemic control measures, including the limit of five people for social gatherings, but only if everyone can work together and keep their guard up. Allowing larger groups to meet would allow bigger families or groups of friends to meet and have meals together. But Mr Gan said an area of concern is dining as people remove masks to eat and drink, but they tend to also talk at the same time. He also said the DOSCON level will remain at orange until the global situation improves. Schools, hawker centres, elder care facilities and other high-risk premises must develop and implement an environmental sanitation programme in 2021. This will include thorough cleaning at least every six months, daily cleaning of toilets and lifts, as well as the pest management plant. These are some of the new mandatory sanitation standards in the Environmental Public Health Amendment Bill, which Minister for Sustainability and the Environment Grace Fu presented to the House for debate today. Among some changes to the bill, spa pools and water playgrounds will need to undergo mandatory licensing by the middle of next year or face penalties. This, was, this will ensure that these water facilities comply with chemical and bacteriological regulatory limits for water quality. Now on to an update on the COVID-19 situation here. Seven new cases were confirmed today, including one case in the community and five residing in dormitories. In addition, there is one imported case who had been placed on stay-home notice upon arrival in Singapore. The Health Ministry will share more details later. In other local news, Travel Revive, a travel event next month, will be the first trade show here to pilot new safety measures for MICE events like automated registration kiosks. The show will also trial contactless technology as well as use plexiglass shields in exhibition booths and meeting pods to reduce transmission of droplets. The two-day event runs from November 25th to 26th and will be held at Marina Bay Sands Expo and Convention Centre. It's expected to host 150 people across Asia. The improvement in Singapore's retail sales continued in August. Compared to the same month a year ago, takings at till declined 5.7%, better than the 8.5% drop recorded in July. However, on a month-on-month -month seasonally adjusted basis, the increase in retail sales tapered off, rising only 1.4%, compared with the 27.2% surge from June to July. 
The estimated total retail sales value in August was about $3.4 billion. Of these, online retail sales made up an estimated 10.9%. The Christmas light-up on Orchard Road will be a scaled-down affair this year with the usual street festivities called off due to the ongoing pandemic. But organisers are still promising a dazzling spectacle when it kicks off on November 13th. For the first time, viewers at home will be able to experience driving along the stretch from Tanglin Mall to Plaza Singapura in a virtual tour featuring 360-degree views. However, the Great Christmas Village Fair that typically accompanies the light-up with food, amusement rides, games and performances will not be returning this year. Over in the US, the COVID-19 diagnosis didn't stop President Donald Trump from making an appearance over the weekend, driving past supporters outside the hospital where he's being treated. Now, he was seen in a dark face, face mask and waving to the crowds as he rolled past in his motorcade. In a video posted to Twitter, Mr. Trump said he was going to pay a little surprise to some of the great patriots on the street. He added he, quote, learned a lot about COVID by really going to school as he battled the virus in hospital. Mr. Trump's doctor said earlier that the president has continued to improve, adding that he could be discharged to the White House as early as today. We're now joined by the Straits Times foreign editor, Bagya Sri Gareka, to discuss this further. Now, Bagya, there have been conflicting reports on Mr. Trump's condition. Now, for one, it's still unclear when he was first diagnosed with COVID-19, and second, on his condition, whether he needed oxygen support. Can you tell us more? Right. So I think one of the few things about uh, Trump's illness is that, uh, you know, the information released has been somewhat limited and it has often been contradictory, right? So uh, you hear, f first of all, the news of his uh, having tested positive came from the president himself. So he tweeted it out, said he and his uh, wife had tested positive. And then there was a question of when did he actually catch it? With Trump, what we do not know is when was his last you know, negative COVID test? So uh, when, until when was he healthy and what's the period in which he could have fallen in? According to the American uh, media reports that I've been reading, that could have been perhaps as early as Monday or Tuesday even. There is this confusion which I think persists because White House is being very careful with the amount and the kind of information that they are releasing. And in the, over the weekend, they seem to have got their message a bit mixed and muddled as well, right? So the, the latest possible update is this, that he has been um, low on oxygen, uh, on his blood oxygen, at least twice uh, since he got COVID. And he was administered uh, or given supplemental oxygen at least once. So this is what we do know. And, you know, there is information as well about his, uh, the various medicines that he's been given. And one or two of them are controversial. The, the drugs cocktail, the antibody cocktail, because it's still experimental, which was given to him. Uh, and the other one is the, you know, the steroid, which is given in cases which are severe or critical. So the question is, why is the president who is, seems to be walking about, he, you know, uh, he toured outside, he's been recording videos, who seems to be fine. Why was he given something that's given to people, a medicine that's given to people when they are perhaps on ventilators? Now, Mr. Trump's uh, COVID-19 diagnosis doesn't appear to his campaigning efforts like the surprise visit to his supporters outside the Walter Reed Military Hospital yesterday. How much of a hit has his campaign taken, uh, seeing that he hasn't taken a break? Well, OK, I'll say that although he is, you know, in a hospital, he's actually able to keep quite a live line to his supporters. You know, he's been tweeting nearly every day. Uh, yesterday, he released, I think it was a four minute video on Twitter where he was speaking directly to camera and, um, you know, talking about what he was doing, how well he was. And, you know, he was looking forward to be back and campaigning on the ground again. He was complaining against having been, you know, told to be confined in a room and it's not something he wanted to do. So basically, he has a direct line to his supporters. He knows what their mood is and he wants to project this image 
uh, of a man who is very much, you know, in the swim of things, who's uh, in hospital, but who is recovering. He says he stays strong. So in that sense, it has an impact at his campaigning. But on the other hand, this is a man who likes to play to the crowds. He enjoys his rallies. And, you know, even during all these COVID months, he's been going out and campaigning. He's been going out to the swing states. He's been holding events uh, to which supporters have come. So this part of it is curtailed for now. The other thing that I think should be important from the, you know, Biden's point of view, because Biden is out campaigning now. Biden hasn't, uh, at some point he was, you know, staying and talking from his, from his house and he was being criticized from, you know, just running this election from his basement. But now you can see he's stepping out, he's out and about. So Biden may be stealing a bit of a march over him in that sense. Uh, Bagya, Mr. Trump isn't the only political leader to have contracted uh, COVID-19. Now, back in March, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson also tested positive for the virus, even spending several days in the ICU. Now, Mr. Johnson's popularity jumped then. Is Mr. Trump seeing a similar effect? Yeah, well, it's hard to say. If you look at just the polls, for instance, if you look at the latest polls that are out, and these show him in a contest with Biden, those would tell you that uh, he's lost ground. He's, according to one poll, at least this is by uh, Wall Street Journal and NBC, he's 14 points behind, uh, you know, Biden at this point. Uh, but is this capturing perhaps the sympathy that's being generated for him? Biden himself has campaigned, uh, has suspended his negative campaigning. So in that sense, I think, uh, there isn't, uh, you know, there isn't a, a measure to capture his, uh, you know, popularity at this point to capture it post COVID. But uh, I think most human beings would have sympathy for someone else who's undergoing this kind of, uh, this kind of thing. On the uh, vice presidential debate that's coming up, it happens on Wednesday. Uh, Kamala Harris, who is Biden's running mate, it's already been reported that she's having to tailor her you know, criticism somewhat because she doesn't want to be attacking, seen directly attacking a person who's sick. Mm. So there is a measure of sympathy towards him. Mm. Uh, it, it might be temporary. We are still a month away from elections. It might help him in that sense. And uh, to compare him to say Boris Johnson, um, well, Boris Johnson, we know, saw a rise in popularity afterwards. There was uh, sympathy for him when he came down with COVID. Um, there, there is a measure of that. However, now that he is, you know, recovered and he is continuing to lead his country in this COVID situation, his popularity levels are again dipping. Hey, thanks Bagya for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure. We've been speaking to the Straits Times foreign editor, Bagarshi Garika. Now visit straitstimes.com for all the latest developments on this story. In the global headlines, U.S. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden tested negative again for COVID-19 on Sunday for the third time since President Donald Trump disclosed his infection. The two presidential candidates had, of course, shared a debate stage in Cleveland last Tuesday. With just about a month ago, a month to go to the November 3rd election, Mr. Biden and his aides have used Mr. Trump's positive test to underline a consistent campaign message that he would handle the pandemic better than Mr. Trump. Former Malaysia Prime Minister Najib Razak's 1MBD trial has been delayed to October 19th as he's in quarantine after travelling to the COVID-19 hotspot of Sabah. The delayed trial revolves around 25 money laundering and corruption charges. Mr Najib was earlier sentenced to 12 years in prison. Tasmanian devils have been released into the wild on Australia's mainland 3,000 years after they went extinct there. Aussie Ark, together with a coalition of other conservation groups, revealed today that 26 of the carnivorous mammals have been released into a 400-hectare sanctuary north of Sydney. There are about less than 25,000 of the endangered animal left in the wild. The Tasmanian devil is one of seven cornerstone species critical to Australia's ecosystem that Aussie Ark plans to reintroduce in the coming years. 
In football, Manchester United manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said his team's 6-1 hammering against Tottenham was his worst day at the club as a manager and a player. The defeat was United's joint worst loss in the Premier League era, equaling their 6-1 defeat by Manchester City in 2011. In a tweet, Marcus Rashford apologised to the club's supporters, stating that the performance was just not good enough and that they deserve so much better than that. Meanwhile, Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp admitted his surprise to Aston Villa's stunning 7-2 victory over the reigning Premier League champions. Aston Villa's Oli Watkins' first half-hat-trick saw the Reds become the first reigning English champions to concede seven goals in a league match since 1953. Klopp said the result was unexpected and that the team could put all our rubbish things and mistakes in one game. Now, Dylan, I know you're a huge fan of Man U. How do you feel? Let's, 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 not, let's not talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, those are our top stories for today. Now, for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Dylan Ang. Join us tomorrow for more stories on A Big Story.